Hello everyone, my name is Gabrielle Welsh. I am the managing editor of The Scene as well as the stage manager for Dialogues 2019. I want to thank you all for joining us here at the 2019 edition of Expo Chicago, the International Exhibition of Contemporary and Modern Art. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Dialogue series presented in partnership with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Dialogues offers panel discussions, conversations, and provocative artist discourse with leading artists, curators, designers, and arts professionals on the current issues that engage them. The topic of the Anthropocene and the impending climate catastrophe has become commonplace in our language and medias. As a part of the special exhibition program at Expo Chicago, the Natural Resources Defense Council, or the NRDC, partnered with the Garage Museum of Contemporary Art in Moscow on their groundbreaking exhibition, the Coming World, Ecology as the New Politics 2030 to 2100. Andrew Wetzler of the NRDC is joined by the garage curator Ekaterina Lazareva and featured artist Kim Abelis as they discuss the role of contemporary art in the environmental activism. Please join us in welcoming our panelists. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ekaterina Lazareva. I'm very glad to be here and I'm absolutely happy to have this uh, collaboration with NRDC, which is a very interesting uh, uh, opportunity for us to present uh, what we are doing in uh, Garage in Moscow here in Chicago. And I thank very much Expo Chicago and personally Stephanie Cristella for the uh, idea to make the connection between our two organizations and uh, we had a very fruitful dialogue, I hope so. Uh, if you already visited our joint booth, uh, could you hang up uh, who already visited? Thank you. Uh, I invite you to visit it after the panel discussion we have here. And um, I would love to uh, make excuses for my uh, accent, for my bad English. <laughs> I hope I don't sound like uh, Russians in uh, Hollywood movies, but, <laughs> but <laughs> let's hope so. Uh, so um, what I actually suggested as the moderator of the discussion is uh, for three of us have like 10 minutes for short presentations of what we are doing if, and what our institutions are doing for you to get more acquainted with us. And then we will have some questions to be discussed among us and with you. And we will uh, then uh, we'll be very grateful if you ask your questions. And I think that will be the most interesting part of the uh, dialogue here. And so I would uh, love to start with uh, Andrew Wetzler. And uh, please, Andrew, would you please uh, talk a bit about NRDC, but I think that may, maybe may, many here already know you, bec also because NRDC participates in Expo Chicago for eight years, but still uh, it's very interesting uh, what this organization is doing, so you're welcome. Thank you, um, and hello everybody, thank you for coming. Uh, and that's the, exactly the first thing I wanted to say, which is just to acknowledge Expo Chicago and our long-standing partnership with them. It's really extraordinary, I think, that a um, world-class art fair like this has carved out um, so much significant real estate, quite frankly, to bring the arts to civil society and to bring civil society to the arts. And one of the things that we think is so exciting about this partnership, which is in our eighth year and is coordinated by our director of art partnerships, Elizabeth Kaur, who's in the audience, um, is that it allows us to reach out to new audiences and let them see our issues in a new way. And it allows us to see our own issues in a new way through the eyes of artists. And I'm sure we'll talk about that later. Just a little bit of background for those of you who may not be familiar with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, NRDC is one of the largest um, nonprofit environmental advocacy groups. We're largely based in the United States, but we have offices and projects around the world, particularly in China and India. Um, we are 50 years old. This is our 50th anniversary. Um, we are about 700 people of staff, mostly composed of lawyers and scientists and economists and policy wonks. We really see our mission as figuring out the solutions to the current environmental crisis that we're in and getting those solutions enacted 
into concrete policy changes at the governmental level, whether that's on the city level or the state level or the federal level here in the United States or internationally. Um, but in addition to that, we also have um, almost two million members and activists who take action through our website, who um, show up to events, who of course contribute to NRDC, and they have a powerful voice as well. And I think as the organization has matured from where it originally started, which was essentially a bunch of lawyers sitting around a room and trying to save the world, to an international advocacy group, we've seen increasingly the need to embrace all forms of activism, and that includes, of course, grassroots activism, um, high level, what's often called grass tops activism, and cultural activism, which is really where the arts comes in. NRDC itself is organized into four main program areas. Um, climate and clean energy is one. The second one is healthy people and thriving communities. Uh, the third is nature, and the fourth is international. I am the managing director of our nature program um, for NRDC, so that covers all of our work from oceans, uh, that focuses on oceans, wildlife, freshwater ecosystems, and wilderness kind of public lands. Um, and that's all over the world, and it's a major part of our focus, and I'm happy to answer any questions about that tonight. I've been um, at NRDC almost 20 years. Uh, I'm a lawyer by training, but I'm kind of, um, I kind of pretend to be a conservation biologist, but don't tell an actual biologist that, they'll get very offended. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention before turning it over to Kim is, this is really a critical time um, for the Earth, and this is actually a critical week in a critical time for the Earth. Um, this is what's known as Climate Week. It is the week that the United Nations is gathering leaders from around the world. Every country essentially in the world is coming to New York City to discuss the Paris Climate Treaty and to update their commitments to that treaty. And this year, of course, has shown an enormous outpouring of public support um, around the environment, support that I think that is really, we haven't seen since maybe the first Earth Day back in 1972. Just yesterday was the global climate strike that NRDC partnered with a youth-led demonstration. It involved four million demonstrators in countries around the world, um, everywhere from Kenya to London to Brisbane to Chicago um, to New York City. Um, and that's because we're seeing an extraordinary change in the environment um, that is becoming more and more concrete for everyday people. Whether it's the hurricanes that are sweeping across the Atlantic, the forest fires which are consuming the Amazon and Siberia and Alaska, um, heat waves and floods here in the Midwest. Um, the Earth is truly on the precipice of a tipping point, um, and it is up to our generation, um, the last generation, that can do something about it. So with that, I'm very excited to hear from Kim and to talk about the role of art and artists in making that change reality. Thanks, Andrew, and also to all the collaborators. This has been an extraordinary experience, beginning with the Garage Museum uh, in early January, I believe, is when we really kicked it off. And I thought I'd show you a few uh, pieces. I, I realized on the way walking over here, I've dealt with garbage on the land, in the water, and also in the air. So. Um, I've been dealing with environmental issues with my work for the last few decades and have had uh, quite a few collaborations with different uh, scientists and organizations, both environmental and um, you know, science centers and different groups uh, for various reasons and a lot of interdisciplinary contacts with that. Um, this storm drain dolphin is actually uh, done with the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Project. Um, it was done uh, in the, uh, let's say, early 90s, and uh, it was actually to teach kids about the uh, storm drain system, uh, the catch basins on the sides of roads. People, for the longest time, used to just throw oil in there and all sorts of smaller objects, and uh, thinking it was like a place a trash can. So um, a lot of my work is actually done. I fabricate these suitcases that are then taken around to schools, different age groups, and are 
used as props, really, though they're pieces of sculpture, uh, to really ask questions to uh, the group that I'm speaking with. The Luxart Institute actually ended up buying it, and they uh, trained people in the San Diego area to take this around in the same way I used to when I first made it. Um, this one I did actually last year. I did a series of 10 valises. I worked for six months with incarcerated women who are doing the firefighting in Los Angeles area uh, and throughout California, actually. Um, the content is really based on their experiences about fire prevention, fire abatement, um, and their experiences uh, during these fires and information they feel that uh, citizens need to know. So um, these are actually funded by the National Endowment for the Arts. That's the second time they've actually funded this sort of otter project. Um, and the idea is that the National Park Service Rangers and also uh, LA County Fire Department uh, representatives take these around to different groups. My big goal is to go to the county fair. I think that is a perfect audience for me. And um, so that was quite a different project, but still based on fabricating these valises from the ground up. Um, I've worked with the California Science Center uh, quite a few times, even during the Reagan administration. They allowed me to do an exhibit on AIDS, which I thought was quite profound. Diane Perlov is the deputy director, and I always thought she was quite brave to always get me to do projects there. Um, in this case, um, she had seen this paper person I made at a local high school out of a week of their trash. And I had made a person out of it, and of course she wanted one of these. <laughs> and uh, it's really dirty business to collect trash and make sculptures out of it. You have to, you know, wash it and iron it, and then you have to make sheets of fabric and then sew them. This one is 45 feet by 48 feet. It's in their permanent collection. If you go to the ecosystems wing at that museum, you'll see it there. Um, but the best thing I think about this piece is that we decided I would collect the trash on Earth Day. So this is Earth Day Trash 2009. That's a day we all think we're doing such good stuff. And I really think that um, part of what the arts can do is really grapple with these complications that we have uh, about our relationship to the way we want to proceed with our lives and, and what we actually do. So I always think that a kid that went to the Science Center on Earth Day in 2009 knows their McDonald's wrapper is in there. So part of it is really kind of a reminder for people in that way. Um, the smog work started, I invented the method in 1987. I made the first one. Pretty simple but uh, effective process where I make a stencil and I put them on different objects and place them on rooftops for varying lengths of time. And the smog is very heavy. The particulate matter is made out of heavy metals. Uh, of course, uh, the majority of it is from cars and truck emission. Uh, even small bits of rubber as the tires hit the road become airborne. Uh, and of course, if you're near factories, that's happening with it also. And um, the topics have been very different uh, for the different processes, a lot to do with the body or our feeling that we have the safety in our homes and so on. Um, this is a dinner table, dinner for two, with the uh, food made out of smog. Um, one piece that I did uh, was the commemorative, presidential commemorative smog plates. Uh, they were left out longer if their environmental records were bad. And they contain their quotes about their feelings about industry and the environment on there. And uh, the full set is 13 plates from McKinley to Bush. I picked McKinley because he was the first president to be sold as a commodity. Uh, he was also made president uh, at the start of the Ford Motor Company, which is, you know, quite a bit what the problem that ended up happening, happening with our vehicles. Um, so the collaboration that I did with the uh, Garage Museum, I gave them a list of topics that I do for the smog and, 
you know, then the last one I listed was political figures. <laughs> And they said, let's go with that. So they actually helped me do the research to get the quotes. I was particularly interested in the, in the things that leaders say at climate summits and international climate meetings. Uh, you know, they say a lot of words, and then I really wanted them to be accountable for what they're really saying. So if you go to um, see the, the work, you'll see that some of them may strike you as sarcastic, you know, um, you know, bragging about the cleanest air and the cleanest environment and so on when you see their portraits in smog. And some of them will actually inspire you to you know, think more about the way we interact about the environment. Um, these are actually images. You know, We put a set of stenciled plates in Moscow near the museum. And I put a few sets out in Los Angeles. And also then I had really found different people in the capitals of these leaders so that there are uh, Macron stencil plates out on a rooftop in Paris right now. Uh, there are some in Berlin. Uh, I'm looking for Ottawa, if there's anyone in the audience. I'm looking for an Ottawa roof. Um, and uh, London. So uh, the idea was to really put it out where their air is of these leaders and so on. And I think that's it. Thank, Thank you. you, Kim. Uh, and uh, maybe we just, uh, no, I mean, uh, this one, uh, uh, Gabriel, can we just uh, start the slideshow? Yes? Uh, because it's, there's uh, some installation shots from uh, the coming of all the colleges, the new politics, 2030, 2100, uh, in Garage Museum of Contemporary Art. And uh, this is a work by um, uh, John Acomfra, uh, London-based artist. Uh, his uh, six-channel installation, Purple. And um, we, have a, we are honored to be part of this um, exhibition tour, premiere tour, um, to host this work in Moscow. And um, there's a very interesting uh, th thing that I heard in one of uh, John Confer's interviews, and I think it could be an, an important point for our further discussion. He said, um, I don't think artists should feel they have responsibilities and duties, but I do feel that they should know that they are responsible. And this is a very uh, ambiguous situation when Art is an autonomous sphere, and it is supposed to be uh, free and independent. And in this case, uh, it, in the environmental fight, it's supposed to be independent agent, maybe to make a commentary. But I would love to further uh, discuss if art could be a useful tool for ecologists and environmental activists and climate activists as well. So uh, in these uh, slide images, you see some of the uh, works from the exhibition. And uh, what I would, say, would love to say about uh, uh, the exhibition to be just short, because it's a huge exhibition with 50 artists, uh, international and uh, historical artists as well, and the works commissioned by Garage for this specific exhibition. Uh, maybe you noticed that we have a very strange timeline that is directed into the future, and I would love to shortly comment upon it, because 2030, was the year uh, when uh, many scientists, including Paul Ehrlich, um, previously um, prognosed that we will have uh, that the oil resources will be um, totally finished on the Earth, and that was meant to be the final of the um, to be the end of uh, pet petro capitalism of oil era, so that we had to like find some other ener energetic resources. And now, of course, we understand that they want uh, that oil will still be uh, after the two th uh, 2030. But still, we will we understand that we will have so many issues of um, limited resources in some specific points, and uh, that will mean that uh, uh, Earth is not that uh, good place to live 
anymore and that we will probably start to find another place for uh, living. And the second uh, date in our timeline is 2100, uh, when uh, famous um, science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke uh, prognosed that uh, the humanity will be able to uh, colonize other planets or to go uh, into interstellar worlds and to live there. That would me mean that we have like uh, some scenario of escape, that we have um, some other planets to live there. And uh, so this is the period which is in a not very distant future when previously was thought that uh, the first date is the ecological cri crisis starts and uh, uh, the last date is when we probably have kind of salvation. Uh, so that's why we um, address to this period into the future with also the understanding of um, future is a kind of uh, understanding of future in a kind of performative way, which means that uh, if we want to change the future, we should do it in the present. We cannot do, do it in the past, in the future. We can do it only right now, right here. And uh, this performative understanding of the future coincides with what um, our one of our uh, scientists invited to make the timeline for the exhibition, Helge Jordheim, uh, said as the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So that's why we don't have many predictions on the exhibition that, and we tried to uh, show some like ideas, some scenarios suggested by the artists that they are uh, of course very different scenarios of the future. And uh, we also have a lot of works that are dedicated, uh, that are um, uh, composed in a section, there is no planet B. Uh, for example, this one is the series of Alan Secula, uh, Black Tide, uh, dedicated to the catastrophe of prestige tanker in the shores of uh, Spain in 2002, which was the huge um, oil catastrophe, uh, uh, and it was uh, Russian oil products that were um, actually uh, polluted the European marine. So uh, there are many other projects. For, for example, Susan uh, Shupley is uh, from Canada. She's working in uh, London, and she's a part of Forensic Architecture uh, Collective. Uh, she did a work dedicated to Chernobyl, uh, which did not represent any uh, proofs, like photographs or video from the uh, polluted area, as it is usually supposed to be. But she just shows a very, uh, in a very dry conceptual way, uh, just 19 covers of uh, Pravda newspaper from the day of the catastrophe till the first uh, met, uh, information about the catastrophe. In, and this is the most important Soviet newspaper. So this is a work about informational politics and that actually it is very important to discuss in uh, terms of when we s speak about atomic energy that is discussed as one of the cleanest uh, and cheapest energy when everything is uh, like uh, on control, when there is no catastrophe. So it is very important to discuss this uh, responsibility, also the responsibility of the states, of the authorities, and how this information should be distributed among people. Uh, how much people should know about what is happening. Uh, and we have also s uh, some projects uh, made with the collect collective Critical Art Ensemble, which is dedicated to polluted mm, uh, water resources in Russia. And um, they asked us to make the research and to suggest to the visitors to vote for saving one of the four resources. One of them is the tap water. And it was quite a difficult situation for us to get to know uh, how polluted these resources are because this information is still uh, kind of censored. It's, it is still kind of uh, closed and you can't find um, like open sources about this. And to finish my um, short talk, I would love to maybe remind you uh, that uh, this year actually marks uh, 50 years after the Earth Art Exhibition at the Cornell University's Gallery in 1969 recognized as a pioneering turn from representation of nature and art 
to direct involvement of natural environments as medium in artistic practice. And the development of land and environmental art coincided with a growing public concern upon the environmental protection, which resulted in the establishment of the Earth Day in 1970 and the birth of environmental politics on governmental level as well as grassroots eco activism. And another exhibition of the same 1969, uh, the ecological art at the John Gibson Gallery in New York have marked the successive engagement of contemporary art with ecology. Uh, and the projects like, for example, Hans Haake's uh, rainwater puri purification plant in 1972 have introduced a new kind of artistic practice as transversal action involved into, politic, into public debates on the urgent environmental issues alongside with scientists and activists. So I think we are now at the point when we have a kind of 50 years history of uh, engagement between contemporary art and environmental politics and uh, uh, organizations that work in this field. And I think that it could be a good start for our conversation. So the first question that I would love to address to Andrew uh, is mm, why does an artist see, which is largely known for its legal and advocacy work, collaborate with artists? And uh, why are these collaboration useful, in your opinion? Uh, well, I, in some ways, the history you just gave us you know, answers that question. Um, I think that what we've come to realize, uh, and certainly what I've come to personally realize, having been doing this work for 20 years, is that um, politics and policy often follows culture. And that culture often follows art. And when I say art, I mean kind of high culture or the leading edge of culture. Um, that artists are uh, tone setters, um, perhaps in an indirect way, for cultural trends, um, whether that's in the fine arts or the performative arts or in fashion. Um, and we cannot, uh, as an organization, productively engage in making policy change and political change unless we're also engaged in the way that we can, which is more limited in some ways, in the project of making cultural change. And artists allow people to see the world in different and unexpected ways. And when they turn that gaze on the ecological crisis, um, they can be part of the project of waking people up. Mm. Uh, so, but do you think that uh, what kind of art is more useful in this case? The art that goes into real public uh, life and uh, it often becomes dematerialized, uh, collective, um, in kind of more process way, uh, is a part of um, public protests, uh, or the aut autonomous art that like kind of produce kind of uh, very strong images that may uh, that has the impact of in, like inspiring and um, f like uh, provo provocative uh, and uh, that makes you think as like kind of more way, uh, like more traditional art? Um, it, it's a great question and the answer is from a total non-artist so take that <laughs> with a grain of salt. Um, my, I mean I don't think it's an either or choice. I think people can do both things. We don't have to choose one or the other. Um, I would say that the, the second kind of art that you talked about um, is something that artists are uniquely positioned to deliver. The first kind of art, the dematerialized, that goes into protests, there are a lot of people who are experts at grassroots organizing and protests and street mobilization and direct action. And they can often deliver a lot of those sorts of um, attention-grabbing, culturally significant actions. So one of the things that we always talk about internally in NRDC when we're thinking about engaging in an issue, because there's lots of environmental groups and there's lots of people doing lots of work, is what is our voice? Like, what, are, what is the niche that we fill? How can, what is our value added to the situation? Are we doing something in a way that, that other people can't do, or are we adding some kind of critical value? And so I'd say the same thing um, when it comes to artists who are thinking about becoming politically engaged, and my gut as a non-artist is, 
it's that unique lens of seeing things in a new way, which is the most value add that artists have on the world. Thank you. Kim, would you love to add something on this question? Yeah, sure. I, I think about this all the time, like every morning. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I agree with what Andrew's saying. There, there are these different angles and ways that we each participate. Uh, when Andrew told me he, you know, had a, a law background the other day when we met, I thought, darn, I wish I had that, you know, because, <laughs> well, it's just because you see so many things uh, proceed based on legal changes, right? Uh, lawsuits, things like that. So that's where that comes from. Um, you know, in the arts, when, uh, when one does uh, projects with groups and things, um, for the longest time, uh, everybody used to value the projects based on, um, I don't know what you call them, those clickers, where you see how many people entered the space. And I did notice um, that idea of like, how many people have you reached? Uh, it's, it's not, it, now it's changed a little bit. Just in the last couple of years, I've seen that pe they come to realize that there's sort of a quality that is also really required about that engagement. Um, I will never really know the kind of impact that the work has had, you know, in exhibition. I, you know, and I do a lot of public type spaces and so on. So it's not for lack of trying to get the work out there. Uh, but I must say the place where I always can actually see with my own eyes uh, change coming over people is often when the work is then translated into workshops where you have people actually engaging kind of hand-eye coordination. Maybe in my case, they're making smog collectors or I've you know done different projects with different kinds of needs and groups. Um, because I think there's something about really engaging someone actively in the concept uh, where they have to think like, what, what image would I make, you know, or what do I think the issue is or the solution, where the conversation based in that workshop really, you know, I've seen people become vegetarians like a few weeks later and things like that. So, you know, maybe that is a little com um, cosmetic of what I see that I feel, wow, I got some success there. Um, she's not going to eat, you know, meat anymore. But, um, but I do think that ultimately all of us, and I'm going to guess at least most of you in the group are engaged in these topics anyway, that, um, that you do want to see some level of uh, success toward that accumulative idea of change. Uh, then uh, I have another question, maybe a little bit like provocative. Uh, well, art is famous for its uh, criticism for like, not taking things um, uh, as they are, and like also always asking questions. And um, do you think that uh, in these collaborations and this engagement of art into uh, environmental agenda, uh, it has some like advantages or some uh, negative points in terms that um, art could not not always believe to official statistics and always like uh, uh, try to um, s somehow subvert uh, things and sometimes uh, has a kind of ironic uh, or skeptical uh, uh, approach to some things. Uh, is it uh, useful or uh, what are the advantages of dealing with such an ambiguous thing which is contemporary art? What do you think? To both of you, um, I, I mean, I think that's one of the critical advantages that artists bring to conversations. I also think that um, that's something that we're all called on to do. Um, the fact is, is that you know, as much as you might wish you had been to law school, there's plenty of lawyers who went there, who wish they went to art school. Believe me, but I don't think that um, we can rely on institutions in the same way that we have. And that's one of the things that we've all learned over the last decade. And that means constantly bringing a critical eye. And so one of the things that artists can do is to help teach that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I, you know, when I started doing that smog work in LA, I, I would ask people about the smog, you know, when I would go to coffee shops and stuff, because I had just moved there from an idyllic setting. I lived in southeastern Ohio in a grain silo that had been converted into a home, and you get the picture, right? And um, I would ask them about the smog, and they always said it was fog. They always said that, and it was part of what got me to do this kind of work because I, it was so horrifying to me that, you know, when you grow up in a place, you get used to it, so you kind of ignore the problems around you. You learn to live with it, right? So um, I do think I've seen this dialogue change a lot. I mean, everybody's got a water bottle they carry with them now, and, you know, there, there's been all these kind of shifts that I see. Um, maybe I'm diverting a little bit, but I, I guess for me what has happened is that I feel like as individuals, many of us have taken up the responsibility for what we were supposed to do. We're all putting forth some effort to try to make a better lifestyle uh, with all these uh, ideas in mind about what we knew, need to do for, envir for the environment. Um, and, you know, I just reached some kind of tipping point in my brain, especially when we started working together and I'm looking at all these world leaders thinking, um, they've got to do this too. I always kind of pushed aside this idea that I was going to, you know, complain toward the government about what they were, you know, doing and their actions and stuff. But, you know, at, at some point, all of us as citizens are trying to chip in or you're trying to maybe educate your neighbor to chip in. And at some point, leadership has to take its responsibility. And the funny thing about me saying that is I'm not looking for, like, some daddy or mommy figure to, like, solve this. I almost, I get it, I almost sound like I'm asking for that. But, um, but I mean, we can't individually do this whole thing. At some point, corporations and governments and leadership they are so in charge. When you walk in Ch around Chicago, you see individuals going to their work and going for their lunch and stuff. And it's like people are just kind of trying to do their lives. And a lot of them are activists, but I don't know. Does anybody agree with me? I, I just... Uh, I, I just feel at some level you can't by yourself do this. Yes, uh, I actually, uh, yeah, we are, uh, if you are ready, we are ready to open the Q&A session, and yes, please. Hi there, thank you for the conversation, it's really good, I think. I just wanted to add to your point, just to strengthen it really, that in the last IPCC report of the United Nations, this is the International Panel for Climate Change from October, um, it was noted clearly that behavior change alone won't save us. And that's the point you're making, I guess, that the systems need to change. We've kind of looked for a long time at behavior change and helping people to change, but it has become very clear over the past decades that this is not going to save us at all. That's what the scientists say. Thank you. So uh, that's actually what uh, I also wanted to uh, ask Andrew, and he said that it's, uh, we, we could discuss it, because uh, I, would, I would wonder what, in your opinion, are the scenarios of escape? Is there any plan B, or there is only plan A, and what, is, what should be the plan A, how to, to save this? Um, well, there, just like there is no you know, the old cliche, there is no planet B, there is definitely no plan B. Um, we are at an incredibly important turning point in the history of the Earth, and particularly the history of um, what we've come to regard as civilization. The science, as laid out by the United Nations, is very clear that we have a limited amount of time to essentially convert our economy 
to 100% net zero carbon. Um, by 2030, if possible, by 2050 at the latest, um, to avert the worst effects of climate change and the worst disruptions. And climate change isn't the only crisis we're dealing with. We're also dealing with an extinction and an ecological crisis, but the solutions are twinned. And um, even if we do that, even if we get off of fossil fuels, which we have to do, we're still going to have to remove massive amounts of greenhouse gas pollution from the atmosphere. Um, in order to stabilize the climate and leave to our children and our grandchildren an earth that it even vaguely resembles the one that we're living in now. Um, and as an aside, we shouldn't forget just how hot the earth can get. Millions of years ago, there were palm trees and alligators in the Arctic Circle. Like it can get a lot hotter um, than most people are talking about. So we have to act in that way. Um, but the, the good news is, is that, those, that the, it's not a technological problem. The solutions are readily apparent. We have the technology to, to transform our energy system now um, at much cheaper than people would have guessed. We have the technology to remove carbon, massive amounts of carbon for the atmosphere also. They're called trees. Um, and um, we have the public awareness and the new lens that artists are bringing and the interaction of civil society. What we lack right now is political will. And that political will is in part a failure of um, people to be involved in politics, but it's also in part the fact that there are half a dozen companies who have a vested economic interest in preventing change. And so the scenario has to be, the only scenario is transform our fossil fuel economy, overcome those handful of companies, and convince the world leaders that they have to act now. Thank you. The question is from there. Hi, this is for you, Andrew. So you were talking about climate change earlier, and um, obviously we're one of the countries that are not in the actual Paris Accord. So recently, Thursday, Google, Amazon said they will be carbon neutral by 2040. Amazon next day said they'll be, car or Google said they'll be uh, Amazon or carbon neutral by in 30 years. So ahead of that 50 year target frame for the cord. So do you see uh, either, you know, companies, corporations making the biggest difference since we're not in the cord? Or do we need that government involvement or both or activism and a combination to kind of, at least in the United States, make that change and make our, make our presence known that way? Um, so I absolutely think we need activism um, at all levels, um, including like this. Um, just a quick technical thing, we're not actually out of the Paris Accord. The Paris Accords say that we've initiated the withdrawal process, but it was written so that the withdrawal could not be finalized for four years. So the final withdrawal of the United States from the Paris Climate Treaty doesn't take effect until I think a day or two days after the next president is inaugurated and thus can be revoked in the first hour of the next presidency, so take that for what it is. Um, but it was clever drafting. Somebody was looking around the corner. Uh, in terms of your question, uh, there's obviously a huge role that companies can play. Um, uh, technology companies in particular consume an enormous amount of power, particularly with data processing centers, and a lot of them are moving to become renewed by 100, uh, powered by 100% renewable energy. Um, obviously, firms like Amazon, which also uses fleets, is more difficult. But um, corporations won't get us there. Corporations are machines. They are set up to function um, by the rules we give them, and those rules are to maximize profits. And um, while we should applaud corporations that are socially responsible, and there are a lot of good people working in corporations trying to make a difference, um, I believe that systems get you the results that you design the systems to get. And so ultimately, you need governments to step in and set those rules and force the changes we need. And in order to get the governments we need, we need to have the people we need pushing for change, which means we need to have public awareness and activism, which again gets us back to the role of artists, I think. Other questions? So speaking of the role of um, artists, um, and uh, Andrew, you mentioned the extinction crisis and um, uh, in terms of creativity and human affinity. 
for the natural world. Um, are any of you seeing emerging, exciting, interesting, cultural change oriented um, projects or, or um, artistic uh, endeavors related to the extinction crisis? Uh, uh, well, I, I must say that uh, we, we show a work that is amazing, uh, that is dedicated to um, uh, parrots. Uh, it's Alore Calzadilia. They, as usual, they work with the Puerto Rican uh, um, local situation, and this is a work called The Great Silence about um, actually the ins extinction of uh, one specific uh, kind of uh, parrot in Amazonian forests and uh, this is a story talked from the like from the face of this parrot uh, who is like amazed why people are have built such a huge um, uh, telescope to communicate with other planets and to try to receive some um, um, like signal that would mean the, the in, uh, like uh, conscious life exists on other planets, uh, but don't recognize that uh, parrots who live close to us are that uh, conscious and the, uh, they are vo vocal learners. They are unique with human in this kind in this sense, and so this is a very emotional uh, work that uh, shows the um, specific uh, kind, uh, species on, on the very edge of extinction. And um, we can only, uh, but we, we don't know what we can change. We, we, we can only understand that if we still like, uh, if everybody, everything is left like that, uh, it will instinct very soon. And uh, um, the, their language won't be deciphered, but they definitely have their own language. So uh, I would say that um, the uh, w art uh, talking about uh, species extinction is, is is really strong, but it doesn't has uh, the receipt. So it's it, in my view, it only can change our understanding, and uh, it could maybe inspire many people to uh, to work with uh, in this sphere to help with their own activity. So I, I would say that sometimes art is just is just art. And I don't know if it's good or bad, but th that's like this. I, I, I'll just add that one thing that I found remarkable walking around Expo is there's a lot of work about the environment here. I mean, not, it's not just NRDC's booth. I mean, right down the hall from NRDC, there's an exhibit which is about glaciers. There's, I saw, a, I saw a photograph that had a bunch of starlings in some kind of mythical rainforest trying to eat, um, you know, fake palm oil gummy candies. Um, and there's other work as well scattered throughout. So at least I've seen a lot more environmentally themed art recently than I have other years coming to the expo and kind of just wandering around. Yeah, that's true. Other questions? So. I kind of wanted to just briefly return to the uh, comments you were making about the, the need for change in both activism uh, as inspired by art in uh, um, commerce and in, in governments and wondering, I think yeah, speaking, I'm sure there are plenty of artists and designers in the audience who are keen to work more effectively and I, I count uh, myself among those. Um, so, and I think one of the frustrations is uh, to, um, you know, art isn't meant to be measurable, but we don't want to be wasting our time either. So how can, uh, do, have you s sort of, got any advice <laughs> uh, or are there any best practices in, in how we can work more effectively and, and link up uh, you know the the artwork with the activism uh, you know with with making some real change um, and that's to any of you <laughs> yeah, I could actually answer that because I get that a lot from um, students when I lecture places um, 
you know, kind of the side issue is people feel guilty that they haven't done work that's political. I kind of sense that in your question. Maybe, um, you know, the thing is, you can always make art that looks and feels political, um, you know, sort of has the ambiance of being activist or something. And um, when I see work that's the most effective, it, it really has some kind of personal link to the person. So um, in other words, it, it can't really come out of sort of a distanced uh, idea of, of these subjects. Uh, you have to kind of create the internal angst, I guess, if you will. Um, you know, when I did the storm drain dolphin, I mean, I really don't like going to the ocean. It really freaks me out. And I really had to learn to love dolphins to do that. And so I don't think it necessarily has to come out of what your uh, background is, you know, that of where you lived or what type of person you are, a class or whatever. I think you can um, develop that empathy, if you will, or that connect personal connection. But I, but I think without that sort of passionate hook within yourself, um, it's really just going to seem like uh, a little bit vapid or a little bit empty. It may look cool. You might have picked the right colors or something. I don't know. But um, I do think it has to be something you might weep over at some point while you're working on it. Um, and I'd just add in terms of working with organizations, um, there's lots of roles that people with art and design backgrounds can play that's helpful for organizations. Data visualization for designers is one of them. Like a lot, actually a lot of I think what's changed a little bit in the public consciousness about climate has been the really creative data visualization of climate data that we've seen over the last 10 years. Um, of course, there's the kind of work that we see here, which is actually you know speaking from a voice and, and gets a prominent uh, gets a prominent airing. But um, organizations, as particularly smaller organizations, often are very welcoming to artists. Um, events at galleries can be great for their members. Um, they often, I think, organizations often struggle about how to um, uh, show their work and their mission in a new and creative way that artists can be helpful with. So there, I think there's lots of opportunities for artists to kind of make as part of their practice directly engaging with whatever organization, whether it's environmental or women's rights or um, racial justice that calls to them. Yeah, I actually, I love that, Andrew. I mean, the one question, well, the one thing our um, scientists always whisper in my ear when we're doing like, I don't know, tours to get everybody educated on a subject, they'll always go, you know, we scientists know a lot, but we don't know how to communicate it to people. And that's really also adjacent to what you're saying. Um, so maybe you don't have to cry, like I said. You know, you could, <laughs> you just do it. Because it's true, they have all the information out there. You can even Google a lot of stuff or have an interview with, you know, someone in your local science center or something, uh, and then just develop a piece from that. I think that's absolutely true, yeah. Just to follow up on that, perhaps, um, I guess a lot of the work we've talked about is is very much around raising awareness and educating people. Um, so there's a clear role there, I can see. What kind of role would you see in helping us to imagine the new kind of systems that we need to live in? Well, uh, for me, it's uh, quite uh, difficult to find a question for a new kind of system um, that will save us. I would uh, just uh, maybe add that uh, as museum, uh, we also try to think uh, a little bit like um, into the future. And uh, we think that also this huge enlightening um, role of the museum is to be a kind of uh, model uh, of behavior for other organizations. And that's what we are doing. For example, we started to sort 
waste, which is not very common in Moscow, and we um, uh, don't uh, like use plastic straws right now, and like we collect uh, recycled uh, clothes, um, batteries, and all this stuff. And we think that not only individuals, but also other organizations and other corporations who are coming to our place uh, see that uh, these are some like small steps that they also can afford to them. And this uh, starts a kind of uh, maybe but too slow movement of understanding that they should, that they are responsible, that they should do something, that they should develop some programs uh, of like, um, well, diversifying their um, activity and like making all uh, some like all the, all the needed um, reforms that Andrew mentioned already. So I think that uh, art sphere is not it's not only artists who join the politics and the protests and uh, it's not only uh, artists who produce a kind of strong image that makes you uh, feel or think about uh, this ecological crisis but it's also art institutions that give some example of uh, what is called sustainable development and we are very quite skeptical all of us about this, but still it's quite an, an important thing also for to be a, like a kind of model example for other corporations. Yeah, I was just thinking smaller units of, you know, like universities, like these, um, they're like social microcosms or something that um, often try to model better ideas. Um, as Andrew said, you know, most of the solutions are actually out there, no need to reinvent wheels in some cases. Um, so I, I, that's where I sort of see the potential of hope, like these smaller units of people that are based in their jobs or, you know, the museums and so on, and um, trying to just sit down and figure out where they can also just set a better model. And, and it gets contagious, doesn't it? when you see that. So. I may be the only non-artist in the room. I certainly am a non-artist. Um, but I, it, it's a question that would lead to a suggestion. Is there anywhere, either within one nation or any international effort, to have an annual environmental art exhibit could be both um, uh, the visual arts, but it could include the performing arts. I think it would be wonderful to get some deep pockets to commit to 10 years up to your 2030, and for the next 10 years, each year, maybe it roves around the world, or it roves around the capitals. And this is really big, and they've got deep pockets to provide monies and awards to the artist, it gives them something to aim for. It's not acting, asking them to necessarily be activists, but to do what they do best. Um, but it really could attract an awful lot of attention. And then of course, the rich people always like to go to these kinds of events, and their deep pockets open up further. And that could be used to go to the NRDC. So that's my thought. This is actually a great idea. It's an amazing idea to have an annual exhibition uh, dedicated to this kind of art. That would be very important, I think. Yeah. I want to interject because we are out of time, but I think that's kind of a great place to end, thinking towards the future. Um, thank you all for coming, and thank you to our panelists. I highly recommend that when you leave, you go straight out to your left, my right, and go see the booth at these lovely folks have put together. And our next Dialogues discussion starts at 2 p.m. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.